Hello to all my people, and if you're watching live, checking us out on YouTube, or listening on your favorite podcast provider, you are most definitely my people. Welcome to another episode of Botch Bots and Chair Shots. I'm your host, a chef by trade and a mark by choice. I am the Will Gray, and joining me tonight, he is one half of the now. He is NWA superstar Vic Delicious. Vic, how are you, brother? Thanks for coming on chat about some wrestling, man. I am doing awesome. Thank you so much for having me. You glossed over an port- important part of your introduction where you said you're a chef. Is that correct? I am a chef by trade and a mark by choice. I was an executive chef for 15 years before I started dabbling in the silly world of journalism. That's awesome. What was your preferred uh, cuisine to cook? Uh, I'm southern to the bone. Country is gravy and biscuits. So uh, I did a lot of southern comforts, barbecue, fried chicken. I'm from Nashville, so that's kind of where I uh, cut my teeth literally and figuratively in the culinary world. So uh, yeah, big uh, southern comforts and stuff like that. I just introduced my kids to uh, country sausage gravy uh, two weeks ago. So, and my son's obsessed now. So, Uh, that's cool. That's really cool. Fun fact about you. So, it is, uh, and it's amazing because a lot of these times I'll kind of talk about food and stuff, and uh, I'll throw that out there, and the guys are like, "Okay, that's cool." Like, uh, (laughs) to me, I spent so long in the field, I don't. It's kind of like, I guess sometimes with you guys, like people are like, oh, you're a pro wrestler. That's awesome. And then like when people are like, you're a chef, that's cool. Like, I don't really think about it. It didn't register because it was such a big part of my life for so long. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. From where I'm from in New York, the Culinary Institute is right, right down the road and traveling around the country as a wrestler, um, finding different cuisines and little local spots, you know, like uh, that diners, drive-ins and dive show, you kind of bring that to life a little bit. And, uh, just the, just the fact that you can try different stuff in different cities and they're, everything's known for different things. And, um, having a specialty like that, being from the South and like the Southern fried chicken, like all that stuff, man, like that's when you can do it right. It's that's good stuff. I, uh, I could sit here and literally spend this whole time talking to you about food, but that's not why we're here. I got you on the line for a reason, my friend. Um, I kind of start all these the same way. Uh, I kind of start with like an origin story. Um, I know with you, before we dive into the OVW stuff and we start going into that, who were you before then? What did you do and how were you able to get yourself on the radar to eventually get into that program? Like, where did you start, I guess? Uh, it's crazy. I was, uh, I, I played football in Utica, New York. I started, uh, we actually started the football team for that college. So I was the captain of the team and, um, wrestling was something I'd always wanted to do. It was, it was my passion and what eventually where my goals were, I wanted to be a pro wrestler. So, uh, there was one time after practice, uh, in football and I wanted to see if anybody wanted to go to Monday night raw in Albany. And, uh, Nobody wanted to go, so I drove myself. I drove all the way down there by myself, and the ticket I got, I was all the way at the top of the Pepsi Arena with my back literally against the back wall of the building. And uh, the guys in the first match, it was uh, one guy, it was Ming or Haku versus this guy named Jeff Starr, and then there was another match with the Acolytes against J.P. Black and Dave Danger. And they announced all of them as from right there in Albany, New York. So as naive as I was, I thought, well, if they're from here, there's got to be wrestling around here somewhere. And subsequently, the next weekend, my parents came to visit me at school and they brought the local newspaper with them. And it had uh, a story about these guys, local guys who had made it to Monday Night Raw and had done dark matches and stuff like that. So, man, I was hooked. The school is in uh, Schenectady, New York. And as soon as I went there with my dad, I was I was in as soon as I saw a wrestling ring. Um, and then from there, that was in 2001, and that things progressed pretty quickly. I started going to Dr. Tom Pritchard camps in the New England area, and Dr. Tom took a liking to me and Aaron Stevens, and we were doing those camps like nonstop, and we were wrestling each other in like the main event of the camp uh, for uh, that entire year, 2002, and so. In January of 2003, I had my first dark match with WWE and wrestled Sean O'Hare. And then the next night, I wrestled Dave Danger, one of the same guys that was in that match. Uh, I wrestled him in Albany, and I actually got a victory, which was cool. I got to have the Fink say the winner of this match, Rob Begley. Yeah, That's a, that's a hell of a, a check mark on that box right there, man, to have the Fink say your name. Yes, it was super cool, man. Like it, You know, you get like little things like that in wrestling where... You know, it, it, 
you're like that really just happened and that was one of them for me i was only uh 20 years old at that time so i was pretty young still uh and then from that dark match i did another uh dr tom camp which got me into the ovw camp and it was the first ever tryout camp for ohio valley wrestling and there was like 60 guys there out of those 60 they picked 10 that were allowed to come and join the program out of those 10 eight came um i was one of them mike mondo a guy named paulie normus a guy named vic divine uh elijah burke was one of them uh Mondo's Gosh. a friend of the show. He's an alum. He's been on here. Mondo's a good dude, man. Yeah, I like yeah. Mike. He's a great guy. Known him for a long time. Long time, and he's one of the best best wrestlers in the world. He's got a mind um, for it, like on a different level than some guys. Like, yeah. It's so fun to wrestle people like him because their brain's always working. And um, a guy that's just like him, Joey Matthews, man, his brain just is constantly moving at a pace where – when you're in there, there is no, there's nothing they can't cover. There's nothing that can't be fixed. There's nothing that can't go right or wrong. Like, so it's, it's fun dance with those guys. Um, so that's how I got into OVW. Like we did that, and uh, I got selected to join the camp. And then for a year, I was an island boy. I did a Hawaiian gimmick, <laughs> I wrestled <laughs> Chris Masters and Brent Albright, and uh, the tr- they were called the Troubleshooters, and then the Jersey Shore Crew, which was Aaron Stevens again, and. Uh, Danny Inferno, you know, the Aaron Stevens theme comes up a lot. Uh, he's in the NWA with me right now, and, you know, we've crossed paths quite a bit, which is kind of cool. Same with Chris Masters, same thing. Uh, yeah. Same thing with Elijah Burke. All of us, same, the same exact story there from Ohio Valley Wrestling in this era from 2003 to 2005. Um, so, yeah, that's from OVW, and then from OVW, man, like, uh, I, part of my college final exam was to uh, develop the Vic Delicious character and debut it on television. Jim Cornette actually came to my college and met with my college professors and my, uh, it was part of like how I graduated school. Like most people have to write like a big long thesis or whatever it is. And mine was my debut on OVW TV. So I wrestled Elijah Burke in my debut. And, um, from there I was kind of like a bad guy toiling in the mid card, lower, lower, lower card. <laughs> uh, I had a match in, uh, 2005 against CM Punk on what was supposed to be Sunday Night Heat, and from there my career kind of just gets crazy. <laughs> um, looking at it, when you you just mentioned one name, Cornette in general, kind of a polarizing figure. Um, you had a chance to work with so many great minds at OVW. Um, I've heard a lot of guys say that if you want to be great at wrestling, work with guys that have either you know done it a long time, paid their bills at it. You know, like a lot of these things, like you talk about working with vets, guys that have been successful wrestlers. What was it like at such a young age to just be surrounded by those guys? Because WWE at the time felt like they had just brought in everybody for those camps, for their developmental, for the WWE. Like they were just scooping guys up left and right. And there you were, would you say, 20 years old, just standing around. And you've got Cornette and Pritchard and all the other guys just standing around you now. Yeah, dude, it was a, a very surreal experience at the time, and it's cool that you even asked that question because it means you kind of get it. But uh, the fact that I was that age and around these dudes, these guys that were going to be um, the next generation of WWE superstars, and when you look at our class and who came out of that class and things like that, it's, it's, it's impressive, number one. Number two, before I'd even gotten there, I had done – you know, those Dr. Tom Pritchard camps and I had gone down to the Funking Conservatory and spent a week with Dory Funk. Um, you know, I'd ha- I've actually trained with as far as the list goes for the best trainers in pro wrestling. There's nobody better that I haven't trained under. I, I had Rip Rogers, Jim Cornette, Danny Davis, Lance Storm, Al Snow, Bill DeMott, uh, you know, I said Dory Funk, Dr. Tom Pritchard, like... That's a who's a who, man. That's a hell of a list of names right there. Yeah, like, those guys, all, and I had a hand, like, they've all had a hand in, like, giving me, like, little pointers and, like, everything, man. Like, there, there's so so much when you, also when you're young and you learn how to be in this business, you're not necessarily, like, the best at taking advice. And, like, it's really an, a, a, an art to be coachable and... Um, you have to put your ego aside big time if you want to be successful. And it's a hard lesson to learn. It takes a long time to get there. And when you look at that class in OVW, 
a lot of us were really young. I mean, you look at the Spirit Squad, like all of those guys, we were all the same age, man. We're like 21, 22, 23 years old. And those guys, we were all getting this exposure and this opportunity like really fast because WWE needed to replenish their roster. It's they the machine, needed, right? Yeah, they needed to put some new acts on there. You look at the Masterpiece when he debuted and you look at um, Muhammad Hassan and you look at... Uh, Matt Morgan and Nathan Jones, and I was telling a story to someone today about uh, I had to wrestle on a loop against Matt Morgan and Nathan Jones for a month, and I'm like, bro, <laughs> <laughs> it was a it was a time like uh, it was definitely interesting. It, just some of the biggest physically guys. I mean, my first match at OVW was against Mark Henry. Uh, it doesn't get any bigger than Mark Henry. They're the like, world's strongest man, right? get any bigger and like as a 20 year old kid laying down on the mat and looking up and having mark henry standing on your stomach you actually realize you're in a whole other world man it's pretty crazy um you mentioned something and uh it's one of those uh, once again it's kind of one of those polarizing names when i was doing my due diligence i saw you cross paths with punk during the infamous summer of punk in 05 before the transition and from ring of honor into wwe he had overlying dates with both company it was a very weird time what was it like for you crossing paths with him like when you guys got to work back then? Uh, man, it was the craziest experience uh, to even like think back on and to, to feel into really. It's, I was, I was there as an extra and, uh, I remember I was walking down a hallway and CM Punk was walking towards me and he stops in front of me and he's like, Hey man, how are you? And I was like, good. <laughs> we had met once or twice, but never nothing, anything more than that. And he said, they, I'm going to debut tonight. And they asked me who I wanted to wrestle against. And I picked you. And I said, well, how do you even know who I am? <laughs> and he said, Jimmy sends me the OVW TV. He said, I think you're a really good heel. And I, was like, I-, I picked you. And I was like, well, man, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And, and he said, Johnny is our agent, which meant John Laurinaitis. And uh, so we went over and we... Uh, we talked and it was surreal to, to be honest because Mickey James was there. She's going to debut as Alexis Lurie with CM Punk. And uh, Johnny is like calling CM Punk's offense in like as almost as if he has no idea what he does. And he's like, finally, he says to him, like, well, what do you do off the top rope? And he's like, that's not the pedigree. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Punk looks at him he's like I don't know man do you watch my stuff I don't do anything off the top rope um, he's like alright well you're gonna do you're gonna do a leg drop he's like okay fine so the way that they called the match was it was exact we did exactly what John Johnny had asked us to do and laid it out that way um, when I got to the back it was uh, people were like patting me on the back clapping for me like and i know it sounds weird to say uh but uh, the agents were pulling me aside and telling me basically that this was i had done great i was gonna be offered a different a deal like uh, multiple people and like i had even called home to my parents and i was like I, this match everything went great they're so happy blah 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 a few hours go by and i hadn't seen anybody really and no one had even talked to me and then finally i see punk and he's walking to leave and I said, Hey man, thank you again for the match. And he's like, uh, Hey man, well they hated it. And I was like, Whoa. what do you mean they hated it? He's like, they hated it. They think that, uh, you had too much offense and that, uh, it wasn't how they wanted, wanted to debut me. So they're gonna, we're not going to do it. And I gotta, I'm basically, it was like, they were telling him he's going to go to OVW. And I was like, completely, blindsided by it because i had no idea like that was the feedback because i had gotten opposite feedback um left hand tells right you, hand kind of thing well it just tells you the political world you're in there and the games that are going on at that time uh and the confusion and like all all that stuff that was happening at that moment and punk uh subsequently ended up going to ovw and having a good run there and actually getting a debut and i don't know if that necessarily would be his choice for how he would choose for his career to go but it is how it went and our careers crossed paths in that way and i became i left ovw shortly thereafter because i had felt that i had done that match really well and i had 
up until that point presented myself really worthy of being in the system and being under full-time contract and all that stuff. And um, up until that point, I was only doing the appearances. I wasn't under a deal with them. And the, uh, the, the, trainers and the leadership and everything at OVW was changing. It had gone from Jim Cornette to Paul Heyman. Um, and we had different, we had one day of the week, we had Al Snow and Lance Storm, and then he'd be there for two weeks. And then uh, Bill DeMott would come in and he'd take two weeks. And then it was, you had no idea even if your, what I was doing in practice was getting relayed to anybody. Like it was just a tough choice and a tough time there. So that's when I decided to leave and go on my own and um, team up with Hale uh, right after that. But it was, you know, it was a crazy time. And there's the footage of the matches on uh, CM Punk's Blu-ray DVD. Uh, you can watch it as an extra. It's like an Easter egg, something like that. Um, but it hasn't been released to anybody out there to see the match. So um, it was a great match. I thought it was everything was good you know as far as when you look back on cm punk's career it certainly wouldn't be what you'd expect for his debut to be so you know you look back you're like all right i get it um at the time i was hoping that that match was going to be the thing that like that was supposed to be the catapult right yeah yeah like that i had arrived in the wrestling world and i was going to start getting my buzz and like how it all worked and it kind of went the opposite way so um it was back to the beginning again with Hale and um that's cool. Like in OVW, man, like we had some of the best tag teams, and I got to watch how they put together Eminem, the Heartthrobs, uh, the the Blonde Bombers, which ended up being the Dicks in WWE. And, uh, they had a really good Jim Cornette put together these teams, and he kind of had a formula for how he did it. And I saw from the outside looking in, I was never close in on those conversations, but I saw basically what the formula was and the things that you had to do and what you had to come up with and like having entrance and having your, having matching gear and having all the things for a tag team, you know, and what better than my childhood best friend than Hale Collins to be my partner. So, uh, the now idea was something he was already doing on his own. And I said, Hey, we should both be that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just kind of how it started. 2007 so we're talking god 17 16 years 16 17 years now yeah man wow. um this is one of my favorite questions and i've just recently started asking it um before we kind of dive into the nwa and what's going on now with you uh pun intended there uh you've been all over you've seen a lot <clears throat> but if you could go back to night one, match one at the very beginning of your career, sit down with young Vic and give him some advice. What are you going to say to that man? Um, really great question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, man, there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a loaded question. I know super loaded question because there's so many lessons that you learn but you have to go through the experience to learn them so in i guess my greater message to my younger self even if i gave my younger self this message i wouldn't be able to receive it but uh just surrender to the process and relax a little bit and try to enjoy it because uh as much as you can try to like force things and um, shoehorn your way into some things, the universe has its own plan. And we are all here for a very specific reason and to fill, fulfill a very specific mission. And just try to relax a little bit, surrender, and live in the now. <laughs> That's corny, a corny as that is, it's actually super great life advice. No, absolutely. And that's the best thing about that is because, you know, I could have this conversation a thousand times with a thousand different guys and ask that same question. And every time you get a totally different response for who, what, where, and why that person was the way they are. And it's, you know, yeah. I love for me on my side of the mic, it's, it's nice to see it in your face where you're like, damn, that's it. You know, that that's, that's good for me. I like that. Um, so now, yeah. Let's talk about the now, you know, here and now, all the puns, all the fun, everything you want to talk about. It's you inhale, 
How's the chemistry? You just said y'all were best friends before. You've been together for 17 years. Y'all are plowing through the NWA tag team division. How's the chemistry like between you and uh, Hell now? Uh, man, it's like we're married. <laughs> as weird as <laughs> We have married couple arguments, and like if you see us sometimes bickering back and forth, you'd be like, "Are you guys serious?" Um, <laughs> but just because we know each other so well, and like we argue about things that like best friends would argue about, uh, you know, we we understand each other's body language, our timing is impeccable, and we have the same goals and the same outlook on wrestling, which is important when you're in a tag team. And I know that there's somebody that's always looking out for me. And he knows there's always somebody looking out for him. And whether that be in the ring or outside of the ring, um, personally and professionally, that's the way it goes. And you'd be very surprised how many people think that's not the case, where they can get in between that wedge. And there's a lot of people think they can get between a marriage, right? You can't. <laughs> and it's tag team. We're tag team partners, and we share everything together um, up into a limit. But, I mean, we know each other top to bottom back and forth and you know we have a goal like at this point in our careers we could have just walked away and there's been a lot of our contemporaries that have you know called it a career and they've put in not you know to get to get a 20-year career out of this business is a, is a lot that's uh, a milestone for sure um you have to have somebody that's got your back and that has the same goal as you to like to actually like do this and make a run of it at the point we are in our career and we want to be world champions that's that's just where it just pushes us and drives us and we want we feel that that's the last thing that can leave our mark on wrestling as a team like we've done a lot of really cool stuff but we want to be recognized on that kind of a level and that's what's really brought us to the nwa and you know the crockett cup last year was the launching pad for that and it's gotten more and more and more the more opportunities we've gotten we've just kind of kept grabbing the ball Let's take a look at the Crockett Cup. Uh, last year, you guys got to lock up with, in my opinions, one of the greatest tag teams in the last probably 10 or 15 years in the Briscoes. Um, sadly enough, we just lost Jay Briscoe. Um, what was it like for you guys to have a chance to work with those guys? That's another one of those cases where I say the universe has its plan and mm -hmm. that things just together. We had never had an opportunity to be in the same place at the same time as the Briscoes. We were... Uh, even when Hale and I were doing House of Hardcore with Tommy Dreamer and the Briscoes were there, there was always, you know, obviously much bigger matches for them that they could be having against the Young Bucks or the Hardys. And, uh, and when you think about the time there, um, of course, we were in the same place at the same time, but it wouldn't have made any sense to have the now versus the Briscoes then. So um, to, to get an opportunity at the Crockett Cup to wrestle those guys and for them to treat us as equals was – them giving back to wrestling without anybody even ever knowing it. And it was a pleasure to wrestle them. And it is one of the things that is super sad about it is that we never get a chance to have that rematch. And we were, you know, quietly hoping that we'd get a chance, you know, opening round of Crockett Cup last year against the Briscoes, final round against the Briscoes this year, because that story is kind of fun. Uh, and unfortunately, that's a story that would never happen at this point. So, you know, being in there with those guys last year, it's special. And it's something that I'm really grateful that we had a chance to do. And I'm thankful and grateful for them for giving us the platform that they did because they could have just had a different match than we had. So. That was a fantastic show all the way around. Y'all were here in the Nashville fair Fairgrounds. Y'all were right in my backyard for it last year. I had a blast at that show. Um, never had a bad experience, you know, putting the putting the NWA over there. I've never had a bad experience at any of your live tapings. Um, so let's talk about it, man. They just announced it either today or yesterday, I think. The Crockett Cup's coming back. It's a huge staple in NWA history. Um, what's your excitement level for it now this year in 2023? Uh, man, if you look back at some of my social media from right through the end of 2022 up until the beginning of this year, I've been talking about the Crockett Cup. And it is uh, like we have been training for it and pushing for it. The referee counted three last year at the end of it. Um, 
we got a chance to come through the NWA and kind of make an impact after that and show everybody what we were capable of. And then, um, you know, up in this last fall, I had uh, like a, just a crazy experience. I had a, a couple of years ago, I had a broken leg and I had a Northeast wrestling match, jumped off the top rope to the floor and shattered my right tibia. And after when I shattered it, it also got infected. And I went through like about a year long rehab process. So my time with the NWA in this last year and um, being in this, the shape that I've been in, um, it's best shape of my career, which has been awesome. And being allowed to like get in there and run and drop kick and do all the things. Uh, some of the hardware that was in my leg became problematic and it was kind of restricting my range of motion. So uh, in the beginning of October, I had an elective surgery to have one of the screws taken out of my leg. And subsequently the infection came back and it was um, a lot worse than they had expected. I had, um, I don't know if, how bacterial infections work and things like that. They, they do blood cultures. And when the blood culture came back, they had seen one bacteria, but there was actually two b different bacteria growing, which is in 99% of the population not possible. But this guy right here. Lucky you, right? So, yeah, man. So they put a wound vac on my leg, and the wound vac actually did the opposite of what it's supposed to do, and it actually fostered the bacterial infection. So I ended up in the ICU for uh, – quite a few days and there was at home antibiotics infusion and i had to do a uh 30 treatments a hyperbaric chamber which is a pressurized oxygenated um program where i had to go into this like tube for 90 minutes every day for 30 minutes or, or for uh 30 days and that was to um add pure oxygen to your blood so bacteria can't grow. And it's the ultimate treatment for bone infections and for um, cellulitis, which I had. And I had E. coli growing in my leg, which was super fun. Um, so in my time away from the NWA, Hale and I both, um, Hale had a, a personal loss in his family that was super close. And the timing of it was crazy because we were going through some personal things and um, getting back to where we are right now in the NWA is a big personal accomplishment for us because we've gone through a lot in the last year and we've been pushing each other to train and stay focused and really, 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 really like narrow in on this Crockett cup because the NWA has a, an, an awesome tag team division. You know, La Rebellion is the world tag team champions. And right now the country gentlemen are the United States tag team champions. And there's a, there's different feuds that are going on. And they, how do you stand out in this environment? Like, what can you possibly do? And how do you stake your claim in 2023? And the, the thing that's left right now is to go get that Crockett Cup and to win the Crockett Cup, stake our claim as the Crockett Cup winners. And that puts us in a position for a tag team championship opportunity. Has to. And we've just tried to make it so that's undeniable. And at the last set of tapings, uh, there's qualifying matches, and that's what we're hoping for to be qualified for and to make an absolute, absolute impactful statement in that match so everybody knows that we are coming for the Kraken Cup. Um, you know, we've gone through a lot, man, and, like, you, you, it's like when you take food away from a dog, how angry they get, and, like, that's, like, you took away my wrestling and you took it away from me for months and months and months, and, like, you've told me I can't do it, and I'm, I'm at this point, we're going to prove you wrong. We're going to go get it. <laughs> That's a, a hell of a story. The The whole process and recovery coming back from injury and everything you just described. Um, this is an off the wall question, man. Like, uh, and take it as you will. Um, how did you handle it mentally during that process? The mental health is such a big thing. Not a lot of people like to talk about it, but to have something taken away that you loved so much and then to spend the last, you know, roughly year building back up to get here now, like, like how was that for you? Um, just going through that process. Well, thank you for asking that question because that's a really important part of this whole thing. And it really gets overlooked a lot is how much an injury or um a setback like that personally can affect you professionally and a lot of times when you just 
show outward emotion is looked as a sign of weakness. And we have to transform that energy for everybody out there that it not be the case. And mentally, when I was, you know, the first time I had the, the infection and they had told me that there was a potential that I could lose my leg and um, to come back from that and get back in the ring and have the run that we had to get back to the Crockett Cup and stuff, that was it was a lot to get there and it was a lot of doctors saying no way, no way, no way. And a lot of proven people wrong. And I had gotten myself sober through that process. I had also gone through a divorce and I had three young kids and uh, to, to overcome a lot of different personal obstacles. It was tough, you know, and then to, to have the run of the last year and then go into a, an elective surgery that was supposed to be, the doctor told me that's a 10 minute surgery. Dude, you'll be, you can wrestle two weeks later in and out. Right. Uh, in and out and then you know i was down and out for thanksgiving and christmas and uh when you're laying in the hospital bed and the the pain i had through my body was the doctors didn't know why and they they couldn't do anything that would make it feel better so i was laying on actual bags of ice and i had fans blowing on me for five days and every minute like felt like an hour and every hour felt like a day and every day felt like a week and it was you know fighting off a bacterial infection inside your body where they don't know why it's happening and they don't know how to stop it and you're praying that your body can fight it off and um you don't know what these medicines are that you're putting in your body and you're trusting people that you don't necessarily want to trust and um your faith is tested and a lot of stuff, man. You go through a lot of things and you have to have some, some sunshine in there and focus on some different things. And the idea of getting to the Crockett cup this year was something that when I was laying in that hospital bed, it pushed me. It gave me motivation to like, this isn't going to be how this story ends. I'm not going to be, this guy who has this happen to him, like, I'm going to get better. I'm going to go back. I'm going to prove it. Like all that stuff. And like, I did it all quietly. I didn't post a lot about it online and I didn't tell a lot of people all about it because I had already done that one time. And to hear that it happened to you again, people are like, well, here's the world's smallest violin, bro. Like, you know, it's it, this time it just happened to be worse and it happened to come at a tough time. And lucky for me, I was in a position as the person to handle the adversity. I had gotten myself, like I said, I had already gone through being sober and that allowed me some clear headedness and allowed me uh, to make better decisions. And I had gone through some spiritual growth and some personal growth where I was able to just be at peace with some of it and um, trust people that I wouldn't normally trust and um, listen to my body more than what I would have. And it, it it is a lot of having some people around you that love you and can give you support and belief in yourself also. And knowing that you have this spark inside you that you were sent here for a reason. And it's, it's that, that journey, you that, that spark leads the way and not any, any outward thing. So sometimes things that can be considered setbacks are great opportunities and, for me, I've had to look at the things that have been setbacks for me as these launching pads um, for being able to tell my story, being able to help other people, being able to just uh, see things that I say out loud actually come true. And like when I verbalize things, how they can materialize in real life and that, that stuff like that's really cool. And to show other people that that's possible also and not to sound like super flighty or anything like that but when you go through a process like what i went through and have dealt with the things that i've gone through in the last few years um you can't really help but have that kind of perspective and being grateful for so many of the opportunities that i have and getting to tell billy corgan part of these stories and stuff like that has been really cool you get to you know i remember sitting on the bus in seventh grade and the kid in front of me on the bus was playing 1979 on his like little boombox thing. I was like, man, that is the coolest song. <laughs> and now that guy's my boss and he sits there and 
you know, he was giving us all support through the trademark thing and he's been on our side through all these different stuff in the last year and he's known about it and uh, it, it, the NWA has been super cool and been there to support us when we've been through a tough time too. And, you know, having a company that you can work for that sticks to their word and uh, does the things that they're going to do or say they're going to do is to me uh, priceless in wrestling. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd run through a brick wall for people like that because I've been on the other side of it where you're just a number or you're, you know, you're not necessarily looked at the same way. So uh, that's how I've gotten myself kind of through all that. So I like hearing that story. Um, I'll pull my curtain back just a little bit for you. I was diagnosed with leukemia in 2021. So that was why I left the kitchen two years yep. ago. And uh, right. I didn't really have anything to fall back on because my entire adult life I had been, you know, a chef. I didn't have anything else. Um, I did have this silly little journalism degree. So I started writing part time just to try to make a couple pennies here and there because I could do it. And the only thing outside of the culinary world I knew anything about was pro wrestling. So I started writing about wrestling two years ago and here we are. So it's like, had I never gotten sick, I'd still be killing myself 80 hours a week instead of doing what I love every day, apparently. So I, uh, I enjoy hearing success stories from people who go through major medical stuff, man, because like you, I spent 30 days in a hospital bed going, what the fuck? How did I get here? And it, it's yeah. tough. Like that's, that's why I asked that question. So, uh, I appreciate you talking to me about it, man. I know that stuff's never easy. Um, let's talk about something a little bit more chipper now though. Um, Chicago, you guys were just up there, Illinois, uh, NWA three, one, two. Um, you got to participate in the Memorial battle Royal. Um, let's talk about that. How was the show? What was the excitement level like for you guys when y'all got up there? Dude, uh, we had a crazy travel day. I left my house at 3.30 in the morning in New York. <laughs> lived at the venue at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Time. Uh, for the first time in my life, I got to the airport, and they told me that the two seats that they had for us were broken and that we weren't going to be allowed to fly on that flight. Uh, wow. When I said, like, well, how'd you know it was our two seats? Like, I don't really get it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and that preceded an entire day of travel craziness. So when we finally got to Chicago, we literally pulled up to the arena. We got inside. We said hello, and we got our stuff on, and we were literally, like, at the curtain to go to the ring. Um, <laughs> the fans were – the first peak that I got of them was when we came through the curtain, and they were, like – the place was packed. They were into it. They were, like, engaged. It was awesome. Like, having a crowd like that, man, is, like – it makes the whole thing like really super fun. So um, there was probably 25 giant humans all in the ring at the same time. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of elbows flying around, a lot of knees and stuff. Um, but you try to, for me, I try to like engage with people that I wouldn't normally get a chance to like, maybe get a chance to wrestle. So like I go over and I'll find homicide and just like punch him in the head or uh, me and Rolando got into it a little bit where you, Bust, I can't even see it here, but he actually headbutted me and busted my head open in the battle royal. Uh, I was like, "Man, the littlest dude's got the hardest head. What's the up?" Littlest with that? dude was the one that dropped you almost, right? Like, <laughs> oh, oh, I, was, I started laughing as soon as he headbutted me. I was like, "Is this for real?" Did, and then I saw <laughs> he really did this. Um, but then you know, having uh, wrecking ball squish you and uh, the. The whole thing, it was it was cool. It, I, never going to say getting squished by Wrecking Ball is fun, but um, we had some moments in there where we got some really good face time. We got some really good, uh, you know, just, just some time on camera to show everybody that we're there. And, you know, Thrill Billy winning that Battle Royal, that guy is on a run. And I think anybody who's paying attention can see that the Thrill Billy is like, got got the momentum right now it's a, his character i'm i'm super into like just his, his the charisma he has and the energy he brings like we tried to eliminate him in the battle royal and what's you know you guys can't hear it and stuff but like hales hales got his upper body and i'm holding his legs and i'm trying to get him over and he's literally laughing at us <laughs> he's like he's like oh no it's the now what am i do <laughs> <laughs> how do you how do you even like take that i don't know it was i just started punching them at that point but it doesn't even... so uh 
it was cool to be in there with, with everybody and to be a part of the pay-per-view is always awesome. You wish you could obviously be victorious, but that wasn't in the cards that night. We had awesome set of tapings the next uh, day after that. The fans showed up. They brought it. They were high energy, which is, um, you know, sometimes in the studio in Nashville it can get a little quiet or um, those tapings. It's all different atmospheres each time. So, um having like a building packed full of people for TV tapings and they're just like rabid animals all day long. It was fun. It made it a lot of fun. So hats off to Chicago. They brought it, you know, we got to see some really cool stuff with, uh, Madam Zuzu's, uh, tea, tea house down the street that Billy owns, and uh, the building studio one that we performed at. It was like a, uh, like a, I don't know, down in the basement, there was literally like, a, it was like a museum of just all this really cool rock and roll memorabilia. Like that's cool everywhere. Yeah. Like, uh, signed microphones and guitars and posters. And it was really awesome. So like Chicago was cool, man. Like every time we've been with NWA, man, we've been in these cool venues, like the chase in St. Louis, like it's getting a chance to perform in a cool place like that. It's <laughs> awesome. The fairgrounds in Nashville is brand new building. Like it's, it's not the, uh, the old lore of the fairgrounds like yeah a brand new building state of the art like it's beautiful to perform in that place so um you know chicago brought it man it was good all right and we had oh go ahead i got pizza we got lou malnati's pizza we couldn't get over <laughs> to G but uh we had some pizza. good if you're in chicago you gotta get the pizza it was it was a lot a late night uh uh decision but we got it <laughs> all right Vic we've done all the damage we can do uh, but I can't let you off the hook I always end with five random questions only one of yours has to do with wrestling I've got them queued up you ready ready number one what's your favorite venue you've ever wrestled in Mid Hudson Civic Center Mid great Hudson. answer number yep. two what's your favorite movie wow Wow. Oh, man. That's messed up. That's so messed up. Uh, Step Brothers. That's a fantastic pick. All right. <laughs> I warned you they were random. Do you yeah. think a hot dog is a sandwich? Yes. That's the perfect answer for that one. <laughs> Number four. What was, your, uh, what was the last show you binge watched? Uh, I think it's called 1839. It's with the... Is that the, the Yellowstone? Two... The, is nope. That... nope, different movie or show? Two boats that... Uh, man, I, I've, I've only... I binge watched like the first 10 episodes, but it's the Poseidon where one of the boats goes... They get a ghost boat and they drag it back and then like all this crazy shit happens. It's like, oh, yeah. I think I remember seeing that. There's like different portals and time loops and like, yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. All right. Question number five. Would you rather never get hungry again or never get thirsty again? Never get hungry again. See, I couldn't give up food. I think I could, if I never got thirsty, meaning I didn't have to worry about dehydrating. I like food too much. The process of eating and cooking and indulging I much prefer over drinking water or anything else. I prefer eating over drinking. That's just my two cents. Yeah. Like as far as like, I, as soon as you said that I go, okay, worst case scenario, I'm like in the desert dying of thirst or like I haven't eaten in a few days. Like which pain inside my body is worse. Uh -huh. that, and, I need brutal. to. Yeah. All right, Vic. <laughs> this is everybody's favorite part of the episode. Cause I don't have to say anything. Um, Plug your stuff, put yourself over, tell everybody where to find you, your socials, anything you got going on that you want to tell us about. All right. On Facebook, we actually share a Facebook account. It's Vic, V-I-K, Hale, H-A-L-E. It's our, both of our first names. Um, so you can find us on there. On Twitter, I am at the now Vic. On Instagram, at Vic Delicious. Um, please say hello. Uh, and tell me you heard our show here, and I'll hook you up with an autographed picture. Boom. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah. 
Well, Vic, it's been a hell of a conversation, man. I, I appreciate your time this evening and uh, stopping by and chatting about some wrestling with me. Likewise, man. This is a great show. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Excellent. For Vic Delicious, I am the Will Gray. Thanks for stopping by and listening, my people.